welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 68, and I'm doing something that I know many of you hate it when I do. I read the iTunes review. I know you guys hate this. I'm sorry. I try not to do it very often, especially since I saw that iTunes review like two years ago. I'm going out of order. I'm doing something that's a show that I said two weeks ago I was going to do something different, and I'm switching it up, and I'm sorry. I had been planning on doing the second of the French Wars episode this week, but it's Black History Month in North America, and I got distracted learning about Black tutors, and I wanted to do an episode devoted to the Black experience in Tudor England, because it's really interesting, and it's really not something that we talk about that often, and I think it should be talked about. So I apologize for going out of order. I hope you will forgive me. Next week, we will be back to war with France, I promise. But before I get started, just a few reminders. First, please check out the Agora Podcast Network of this of which this podcast is a proud member. When the Renaissance English History Podcast was the podcast of the month back over the summer, I actually did a really cool question and answer session with them called The Exchange, and you can actually listen to it on their website, agorapodcastnetwork.com. I'll also put a link up on the show notes. And speaking of show notes, you can get show notes for each episode This week's are pretty extensive, along with the book recommendations at englandgas.com. You can also sign up for the newsletter list, get extra mini casts, special book giveaways, all kinds of fun stuff by going to englandgas.com. So go there, get the links, all that. So there are a lot of misconceptions about being black in Tudor England, and I want to try to debunk those in this episode. The first one is that there really weren't any black tutors because, you know, you don't see them in any of the shows and you don't really read about them. And in fact, there were actually many black people in Tudor England, and some of them had really high positions in the government and at court. And secondly, you might think that if you were black in the 16th century in England, you were likely a slave. Also, not true. Like I just said, some people had very high up roles at court and there are, bl- there are parish records of black people being buried in parish graveyards, marrying white English women. There was even a black knight who helped win a victory against the Scots. So let's talk first about the status of black people in Tudor England. The slave trade in England didn't really take off until the mid-1640s, so during the reigns of the Tudors, there wouldn't have been a slave trade, or really slavery as we know it. In fact, in English law, it was not actually possible to be a slave in England. So during the 16th century, the black population was mostly free. There were servants, of course, um, but there weren't any legal slaves And there were many intermarriages, as I've said before. There were black people in England all the way back during Roman times, and certainly they would have been seen from time to time throughout the Middle Ages. In fact, in 1205, the close rules of King John give a mandate to the constable of Northampton to retain a Peter the Saracen, maker of crossbows, and another with him for the king's service and allow him 12 D a day. So there were black people in England in 1205, but it's really during the Elizabethan period that we saw this large rise in black population that was down to trade, to exploration, to, you know, a lot more traveling going around just globally. And that actually eventually led to Queen Elizabeth putting out a few proclamations about the number of black people in the country. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Going back to the beginning of the century, in 1501, Catherine of Aragon came to England to marry Prince Arthur. She came from southern Spain, which had been ruled by the Moors until just recently, in 1492 was when 
the fall of Granada happened. And even today, it still reflects much of the Moorish history. So I live in Andalusia, and I live just a few hours from where Catherine grew up at the Alhambra. And in my town, there are still, there's still a Moorish palace, and it has gorgeous tiling and gardens. And, you know, there's that kind of look that kind of Moroccan look where you have like the arches and, and they're, it looks very mathematical. And that's what the architecture in my town looks like. There's a medieval wall built by the Moors and it really has that Moroccan flavor to it. So Catherine would have been exposed to the Moors and to Africans in general. And in her retinue, when she came to England, there were several black people, maids and musicians. One was John Blank. He was a famous trumpeter. Little is known about his life other than that he was in Catherine's retinue. He did successfully petition Henry for a raise in 1507, and that was successful. And actually, that would have been Henry VII that he petitioned for a raise. So being successful at that really showed that he had some bargaining skills. And he was also part of the celebration for Henry VIII's only son with Catherine of Aragon, Henry, Duke of Cornwall, He's portrayed in paintings from the event. The Iberian Moor Catalina de Cardonas was another member of Catherine's retinue. She served for 26 years as Lady of the Bedchamber, and she married someone called Athe Baestas, a crossbowman who was also of Moorish origin. Later on, Robert Cecil would have a black servant called Fortunus, So they were at court, definitely. One story I want to tell you about is the first black tutor made a knight. Sir Pedro Negro was a Spanish mercenary soldier. And in 1546, during Henry VIII's last kind of big war with France, he traveled into France with other Spanish fighters under the command of Colonel Pedro de Gamba. The Spanish mercenaries won a great battle against the French, and they were awarded annuities. So Negro was awarded 75 pounds in August and 100 pounds in September of that year. And then in September 1547, so a year later, he was knighted by the Duke of Somerset at Roxburgh after taking Leith Castle. Now in 1549, the Scots were besieging Haddington Castle. This was during a period of tough relations with Scotland. Edward VI had started, restarted the rough wooing to get Mary, Queen of Scots, to marry into England. So the Scots were besieging Haddington Castle, and Negro led a charge through the Scots to reinforce Haddington with gunpowder. That allowed them to continue to defend themselves much longer. Sir Pedro Negro died in 1551 of the sweating sickness, and his funeral was a huge occasion. The street was hung with black cloth, which was a sign of respect. It cost a lot of money to get black cloth. So to hang the street with black cloth showed how respected he was. And with his arms, and there were all sorts of musicians and parades honoring him. As early as 1558, there are parish records mentioning Africans being buried in full Christian sanctified ground in the graveyards. They were often called blackamoors. Blacks, Moors, Negroes, and Ethiopians. And like I said, they often intermarried. So one James Allen saw an African prince. He had been enslaved at 15, served in the British Army, and later settled near Colchester, marry an English woman. And in his memoirs, he wrote, I have seen myself an Ethiopian black as coal taking a fair English woman as a wife. They begat a son in all respects as black as the father. Unquote. So, again, intermarriage was something you might, might write about in your memoirs, but it wasn't that particularly uh, outlandish to see. And as the slave trade from Spain and Portugal grew, and the English pirates like Francis Drake came into contact with them, more and more Africans would have been appearing in England. So this is reflected in Shakespeare, for example, with characters like Othello one of the most famous Shakespeare characters. And that showed that there were plenty of black people in London at the time. There was an African on board the Golden Hind when Drake left London and three others joined the ship during its voyage. So again, playing a part in that very historic voyage, even from the beginning. 
There were actually enough black people in England so that Queen Elizabeth thought that she had to do something about it by the late 1590s. By this point, many wealthy landowners would have had one or maybe two black servants, and they were common servants throughout society. And in 1596, Elizabeth issued a proclamation writing to the mayors of major cities that there were, quote, of late, diverse black moors brought into this realm, of which kind people there are already here too many, unquote. She ordered that, quote, those kind of people should be sent forth of the land, unquote. At the same time, she made an arrangement for a merchant. His name was Caspar von Senden to deport the black people. It seems that the aim was either to sell them to get money to ransom or to do an even trade with Spain and Portugal to get English prisoners who were held there. The problem was that Elizabeth didn't offer any kind of compensation to the employers to part with their servants, and so most just didn't pay any attention to it and refused to let them go. In 1601, she issued another proclamation saying that she wasn't happy with the number of black moors which are crept into this realm. That's a quote. And she again gave Sendin a license to deport them. But it doesn't seem that this was any more successful than the first attempt. Like it or not, it seems that black people had found a home in Tudor, England and were there. But why did Elizabeth suddenly want to deport them? As we've talked about in this podcast before, one of the things I find fascinating about the 16th century is that we saw this move towards being a more modern society, right? If you were dropped in England in 1485, it would have been like another planet. If you were dropped in England in 1603, it would have been like another country, but you might have been able to figure your way out, right? So part of that was the breakdown of feudalism. And So a lot of the kind of ways that society was structured and the people having their own particular roles was totally falling by the wayside in the 16th century. And so there had been this very clear class system, very clear way that the serfs were here and the landowners were here and everything like that. It it wasn't so clearly spelled out by the late 15th century, but, you know, there was still this feudalistic society in 1485 that was starting to fall apart. And the ruling classes became really worried about poverty and vagrancy as this feudal society basically died a slow death. And they, of course, feared disorder, societal breakdown, basically anything else that would challenge them. So they came up with a series of poor laws to deal with their fears. Then we also saw in the 1590s a series of bad harvests And suddenly there was more poverty and vagrancy than ever. And Elizabeth seemed to be trying to place blame on the black population for the social problems. In 1601, in that proclamation, she said that the black people were, quote, fostered and relieved here to the great annoyance of the queen's own liege people, that want of relief, which those people consume. So basically they were taking up social welfare that should have gone to the English population. It also said that, quote, most of them are infidels, having no understanding of Christ or his gospel. Of course, as I said before, this isn't actually true, since many parish records show Christian burials for Africans, and there's no evidence to show that they were any poorer than any other group of people in Elizabethan society. But as those of you who also listened to the recent episode on xenophobia that I did, will remember this was a time when it didn't take a lot to make a native English person feel threatened. Now, that's not a political commentary. Well, maybe it is a little bit, but it's just how it was. So, you know, this was a period of great upheaval, of new stresses being put on society, a lot of newcomers coming in, and, you know, suddenly kind of society breaking down, the old order of things breaking down. So, It was a a tinderbox, as it were, and it didn't take much to set that off. And the Black population, as well as the Jewish population and the immigrant population, you know, kind of suffered from that. 
So I, I want to move on to a story that was featured in the BBC History Extra magazine in 2012 on London's first sort of black neighborhood. And this is looking at the parish records of St. Baldolph's outside Aldgate. And it shows 25 black people in the later part of the 16th century. They are mainly servants. They are mainly servants. One who was next to the Bell Foundry off Whitechapel Road likely worked at the foundry. And some were given very high status funerals, like I said, with black cloth, which would have shown the high level of respect that they were given by their employers and their colleagues. So some of the names are, we've got a Christopher Capravert, which meant from Cape Verde, and he was just listed as a black moor. We've got Domingo, a black Negro servant unto Sir William Winter. We've got Susanna Peavis, a black Moor servant to John Depinoa. Uh, we've got Simon Valencia, a black Moor servant to Stephen Dryfield, a needlemaker. And there's more like this. There's Cassango, a black Moor servant to Mr. Thomas Barber, a merchant. Um, later names we find Anne Vouse, a Blackmore wife to Anthony Vouse, trumpeter. And a very sad one is Marie, a Blackamore woman that died in the street. Sometimes the detail in the register can be very revealing. So in 1597, for example, there's a listing of Mary Phyllis. She had been the servant of a widow, Barker, and Mark Lane for years. She'd been in England for about 13 years She was the daughter of a Moorish shovel maker and basket maker. She was never christened. She became the servant of a seamstress living in East Smithfield called Millicent Porter. At that point, she, quote, taking some hold of faith in Jesus Christ, was desirous to become a Christian. Wherefore, she made suit by her said mistress to have some conference with the curate. So she was examined in her faith by the vicar at St. Baltoff's, and she answered him very, quote, Christian-like. She did her catechisms, she said the Lord's Prayer, and she was baptized in 1597 on the 3rd of June in front of the entire congregation. And her witnesses included a group of five women, mostly wives of the leading parishioners. And she was then listed as a lively member of the church in Aldgate. And certainly it's clear that she belonged to a community there. She was part of the community of the church and she had friends there. But then there was also the downside to the lives of black Tudor women, some of whom worked along white counterparts as prostitutes in Southwark and in the brothel area in Clerkenwell One of them was Lucy Negro. She was a former dancer for the Queen. She was actually an entrepreneur. She ran an establishment that saw customers, a customer base of noblemen and lawyers. And she was famous enough that she was actually paid a mock homage in the Inns of Court revels at Gray's Inn. Her area of London was really famous. So one Dennis Edwards wrote in 1602, pray inquire after and secure my negress. She is certainly at the Swan, a Dane's beer shop in Turnmill Street. And then one of Shakespeare's acquaintances, a poet called John Weaver, also <laughs> wrote of the, his praises of a woman whose face was, quote, pure black as ebony, jet black, unquote. So this article in this research that was in History Extra looking at these parish records, it shows this kind of microcosm of what life was like for Black Tudors in this one parish record. And that is to say that it's pretty much the same as life for white tutors. Some were knights, some lived at court, some worked for advisors, some worked for the queen and had very high status. Others were prostitutes. Some ran the brothel, which showed a certain entrepreneurial spirit, right? And so I guess the point is it ran the entire spectrum just in, you know, kind of one parish looking at these records. You saw one woman becoming a Christian at the church with the support of the leading wives, the leading ladies of the church, and you see the prostitutes. 
And so th- at this point in English history, the black experience before the slave trade really began in earnest in England was very similar in many ways to the white experience. And while certainly black people would have been seen as other and were often scapegoated, like in Elizabeth's proclamation, Elizabeth made other proclamations about other foreigners as well. So it wasn't simply black people and they still had a role in Tudor society. And the pop culture that leaves them out of that is doing a great disservice to portraying the accurate history of the time. So I, you know, I really didn't think about it that court would have had black people in it. it. It just isn't something that you think about. And yet I think it's valuable that so often this particular period in history is seen as something that, you know, is of interest or just reflects the interests of, of a white population. And there's actually a historian who said that you know, she's been told that in this curriculum, black people don't exist. I'm trying to find her name. Her name is Marika Sherwood. She says that black people often say in this curriculum, I don't exist. And black people did exist in this curriculum. And I think that we should talk about that and, and it should be researched and, and shown and, and portrayed accurately when we're going to do shows, we're going to do these period dramas. Like we should, we should do our best to kind of reflect that. So that's my story on Black Tutors. The book recommendation for this week is Onyeka Nubia's Black Amours, Africans in Tudor England, Their Present Status and Origins. Remember, there are extensive show notes, the book recommendation, everything like that at englandcast.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll be back next week, I promise, with more on France, war with France, now with Henry VIII making war with France. So that'll be exciting. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening, you guys. Have a great week, and I will talk with you again soon. Bye-bye. Blown on the wind, a sandal may be sweating. Blown on the wind, blow, blow, blow. I caught a board in Bowerbreak, that's all his family is on sea.